Okay, so welcome everyone. Sorry, that was too loud. Welcome everyone to our uh, special keynote session today with Dr. Ellen Zagura. Um, we are incredibly proud that she accepted the invitation to come in and give us this uh, keynote speech. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. Dr. Ellen Zagura is a fellow of the ACM, fellow of the IEEE, with a stellar and amazing career over many organizations that are dedicated to helping you know, the next generation of computer scientists. Uh, like the Computing Resource Association, which she's been with for quite some time. Um, uh, Dr. Ellen led many amazing initiatives over the year, like over the years, like uh, Computing for Good, uh, which was established in 2008, I believe, to uh, you know help bring computing to real-world problems, and it's really been amazing and a, and a highlight of one of one of the major highlights of her career at Georgia Tech as a professor in computer science there. Dr. Ellen's CV needs no uh, highlighting. Um, she's uh, amazing and had many contributions to foundational problems in computer networking, and we're so glad to have her with us today. Without further ado, Dr. Zagur. Thank you. Thank you all, um, and thank you, Sharif. Is the mic in an okay position? Okay, wonderful. So I uh, appreciate the introduction. Um, you know, <laughs> You know you're getting old when it takes a while to introduce you. you know, what are what are the all the all the things? Um, and uh, Sharif didn't mention, but um, uh, it is on this slide that the most recent new thing that I'm doing is that um, as of six weeks ago, I think it was six weeks ago yesterday, um, I am a rotator at the National Science Foundation in the United States. Um, the National Science Foundation is the largest funder of academic computer science research in the, in the U.S. Um, and anyone in the, who's based in the U.S. is very familiar with NSF, um, and those of you from other countries will be very familiar with your own science funding agencies, and you know how important those are to the vitality of our field. I mean, basically, it's, it, it lets us do the work that we do. So I'll say a little bit at the, at the end about, about NSF, I guess, but I will, will say one thing in the beginning. Um, you should be grateful that you were not on the email thread concerning whether or not I could be here. Um, <laughs> because it was long and it was flipping and flopping back and forth um, as the winds changed in the US Congress regarding whether or not there would be a shutdown of the federal government, which I've learned at NSF is called a lapse. So they don't, they, meaning a lapse in funding. They don't really tend to, they call it a lapse. So I, I told Sharif, you know, I, I, and I'm, because I'm new, I didn't fully understand what the implications were gonna be if there was a shutdown. So for a while I said, well, I think there's gonna be a shutdown, but I can still show up. And then my boss told me, no, 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 you cannot show up if there's a shutdown. And I said, okay, so let's have a virtual plan. So we had a virtual plan. And then I told him, now that we've arranged this virtual plan, we've gone back and forth so many times, we've probably ensured that there will not be a shutdown. But I was completely joking. I mean, I, when I said that, I was 99% sure there was gonna be a shutdown. I'm pressing refresh in my browser, my CNN, New York Times browser, all day, Saturday evening, end of the day, what do you know? No shutdown. So if this were 45 days from now, maybe there is gonna be a shutdown. They passed a short-term spending uh, allotment. But um, yeah, so I feel like I worked, <laughs> Sharif worked really hard to get me here by having to be in, in all these, uh, these conversations. So anyway, I am even more delighted than I would otherwise have been <laughs> to be here because it means that uh, the government is still functioning in some fashion. Okay, so um, I have been at Georgia Tech for 30 years. My, I started, believe it or not, in 1993, fall 1993, um, and even I am kind of shocked to have been in one place and, and for that period of time. So I'm gonna do a bit of reflecting on my research career, and then I'm gonna talk about um, some of the work that I'm most excited about right now. Um, and so that'll be a little bit of a deeper dive. I'll say some philosophical things about how to choose the problems you work on and then touch a little bit on, on NSF. So, and I'm, please feel, if you would like to ask questions during the talk, I have no problem with that at all. So just raise your hand, don't bother going to the mic. I can repeat the question, okay? So um, it's a, I, 
well, as Sharif said, any professor can talk for any length of time. I'm not gonna <laughs> talk for 90 minutes, um, and it will be boring if I do all the, you know. In any case, if you ask no questions, I still will not talk for 90 minutes. But if you ask questions, we can make it interactive. I'm really happy to do that. All right, so let me talk about, I just wanted to say a little bit about, about me. I think this, maybe it's more helpful for people who are younger in the field, but just to say, like, here's how I got here. Um, I, I grew up in Maryland, um, and I went to Washington University in St. Louis uh, as an undergraduate, and um, I guess I liked challenges, so I, and there was no such thing as computer engineering degree at that time. So I double majored in computer science and electrical engineering. Um, and then I, without really understanding why, kind of gravitated towards computer science. Now I think I get it that I liked to be a little closer to the human side of things, which is not to say that electrical engineering can't be that, but computer science I think had a little bit of a up the stack, as we would say in networking, kind of focus. Um, and then I ended up staying there you know, for all of my degrees and I happened to work at that time, early 1990s, there was a competitor technology to uh, IP packets, which was called asynchronous transfer mode, ATM, um, and my advisor and therefore I was interested in high speed, how to make those high speed routers basically, high speed switches suitable because that was one of the that was one of the potential advantages over IP forwarding was that it was slow and so ATM was proposed as an alternative that would be faster. Um, and I then came to Georgia Tech, but almost immediately I, um, the excitement of the internet kind of swept me up and I, and I really abandoned the ATM switching work that I was doing and, and really pivoted to working on, on, the, on internet related things. And I'll talk about three phases of my research career and then I feel like I'm now in the fourth phase. Um, and as Sharif mentioned, I've, I've found it to be um, rewarding to work in areas that we would call service. You know, some, oftentimes we, we think of service as like the third rail, the thing we don't, like of course we are gonna teach and many of us love teaching and, but of course we're gonna do research and service is often the thing that we try to get out of or like do a bad job because then they won't ask you to do it. Um, there's something really wrong with that model. But I have found it to be rewarding and I, have, I was department chair for seven years. I, um, and then I was part of the Computing Research Association which in the United States is a quite an influential group um, that, that tries to essentially support the research ecosystem. I was chair of the board for two years. Um, and I see NSF as, you know, a next step in that kind of tra trajectory. All right, and that's my husband. This is a, we took a picture just like this in 1993 or so, or maybe even 1987 when we finished undergrad, and then at a reunion, my, my daughter took this. I think we had a little bit harder time getting up there. In fact, my husband does not look very, um, comfortable. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, here's a kind of uh, three, uh, uh, three phases uh, that I think about when I think about my research career. And I, I put up, this is a little bit outdated, it's not a current snapshot of citations, but you'll recognize that this is a Google Scholar, these are Google Scholar snapshots, um, uh, just to give you a perspective on, on dates and also on citation counts. Okay, so, um, uh, when I, in, for my master's degree, I, I worked in the area of, of uh, computer architecture and parallel systems. Um, so I, I did a master's thesis and then, I, and then I really switched to networking. So in that master's thesis work, I programmed one of the first commercially available parallel computers. It was called, anybody recognize N-Cube? I've had occasionally people in the audience like start nodding with big smiles on their faces, but nobody, maybe Tim remembers it. Um, it was a commercial, commercially available parallel processor. It had a hypercube interconnection structure. Um, we had one of them at Washington University. I think it had 16 processors in this interconnection structure. And I worked on a, a parallel approach to an optimization heuristic called simulated annealing. Um, 
and had the good fortune to publish several papers from my master's thesis. And this really kind of got me hooked on research. I started the master's program not intending to get a PhD. I just wanted to do something beyond. I wasn't ready to go into a job. Actually, the jobs at that time seemed super boring. 1987, computer science, it was, yeah. So, so uh, okay, so I did that and, I, and I, I got to, and then my advisor for my PhD thesis, John Turner, and Mark Franklin together had a lab, and so I was quite around people who were doing networking as well as, as architecture, and so then I, I, I switched to working um, with John, and I already mentioned that I did these ATM switch-related kind of performance and cost analysis. That was a lot of my, my PhD thesis. Well, I came to Georgia Tech in 1993, and like I said, I kind of pivoted to working on the internet, and I, and I, um, I had a wonderful student, Bobby Bhattacharji, who's faculty at the University of Maryland, um, and he was interested in lots of things, and Ken Calvert uh, and I co-advised Bobby, and we worked on uh, a project, which is actually my highest citation count. I'm not sure what it says when, like, you're the third year of your career, <laughs> like, have this, this peak, but anyway, I'm glad to have it. Uh, it happened early. Um, we developed a set of tools for modeling the topological structure of the internet. It happened at the time that people were um, use, largely using random graphs as a way to model topological structure. You would then you know, put those into simulations to the discussion this morning about simulation and emulation, although you actually, they're also valuable for emulation. If you need to have an emulated topo topological structure, you would still need a topology modeler. And it turned out to hit a sweet spot. Many people were studying protocols uh, that they wanted to run on the internet, but there was really just no way to test them. You know, it's pre-Planet Lab, pre, you know, really pre-test beds. Um, and so simulation was the tool. Uh, and so this provided an, an input, a, let you parameterize a simulation. Of course, you would add all kinds of other things like workloads and and et cetera, but the topology was a really fundamental characteristic of the simulation that many people needed, and so they were able to sort of plug this in. Actually, it happened that the, the Olympics were in Atlanta in 1996, and we were kicked off the campus because it was the Olympic Village and the diving arena, and I have this, and this was when, you know, nobody worked from home. Like, if you were kicked out of your office, you were like, wait a minute, I can't get anything done. Um, so I distinctly, actually my, our office was not in the ring because we were in a weird building. And I distinctly remember working on, you know, the release of the software. Like we had the time and we said, let's package this up so we can put it out there. Of course, this is now standard practice, but at the time it was not that common. You know, people write a paper, say, I did this great thing, but you, would, you couldn't get to it. Or, I mean, you'd email them maybe and they'd send it to you, but we put it out there. And I think that also made a big difference in the success of that project. So I worked for about a decade on uh, kind of wired internet types of projects. And then I got interested in, uh, I, I sort of things felt like they were in a lull, and those who are old enough to remember, there really was kind of a lull in networking research in the late, in the early 2000s. But many things were becoming ossified, whoops, ossified because of commercialization. So early 90s, it was a bit of the Wild West. Academics were participating in the IETF. They were influencing protocol development. But as the 90s progressed and the internet became so embedded in, in commercial uh, uh, products and commercial services, it was much harder to tinker with things. And so it was sort of like, okay, what academics asking, what do we do now? Where's our opportunity for influence? So I, I, I kind of switched gears um, and started doing a lot of work in the area of mobile wireless and um, including a, pro a project area that was being called disruption tolerant networking or delay tolerant networking. It had, uh, in the US, DARPA was interested in it for obvious reasons. And I was uh, attracted by how different the paradigm was than the internet paradigm. So in disruption tolerant networks, you have the possibility that the network is disconnected, at least for periods of time, 
mobility is causing all these topology changes. Sometimes things, there's end-to-end -end connectivity. Sometimes there isn't end-to-end -end connectivity. And you want your routing algorithms and your services to, ad to be tolerant to not always having a contemporaneous end-to-end -end path. And that was just a fun alternate world to think about. Um, towards the end of the 2000s, uh, Sharifa mentioned um, 2008, I guess I, maybe I just every 10 years get a little bit bored. I, I, um, I, I really was wanting some way to connect more closely to pressing societal problems. And I didn't really know how to do that in my research. Um, so I started teaching a project-based class with some other faculty where we had nonprofits and local and local government. The CD Center for Disease Control happens to be in Atlanta. That was a, a strong partner of ours. Um, CARE, which is an international organization, uh, uh, also based in Atlanta. And we started sourcing, vetting and sourcing these projects that came from nonprofits and local government and creating student teams to work on them for a semester, mostly building software. Um, and the best of those projects lasted more than a semester because you can't write software that works in a semester. And so we had some ways that we would have projects carry over. And one of the projects that was most meaningful and successful that I directly worked on was in collaboration with the Carter Center. This is the center that Jimmy, President Jimmy Carter and his wife Rosalind Carter created after his presidency. Um, I think he just turned 99, which is yeah. amazing. Uh, so this is the Carter Center. They were working in the West African country of Liberia. Um, and they were, they were working on um, growing the capacity to treat mental health uh, issues. Um, and so we worked on some um, tools to allow these mental health clinicians to do reporting on what they were seeing and what outcomes they were achieving. And you know what? It was a disruption tolerant, and it was a disruption environment. Many times these clinicians were working in parts of the country that had no internet access. Then they would travel back, they would travel to Monrovia, for example, the capital, or they would travel to places, or they would have a, a cellular device that they had some money on, but they weren't gonna turn it on all the time. So it actually turned out to be a real world example of a disruption tolerant or in, you know, environment. Um, and I wrote a paper uh, about that um, in a venue that you all, probably most of you wouldn't recognize. Um, and I got the highest reviews I think I've ever gotten on any paper. Um, but it has very few citations. So there's a lesson here, there's something here about, about you know, sometimes impactful and important work doesn't get recognized or picked up in, in kind of academic research. Um, okay, and, and, uh, and I've had, I've been recognized for my work by IEEE ACM and I've, finished, I've graduated 23 PhD students, I have five at the moment, and they are split over, um, one is doing kind of traditional networking video, video streaming, video conferencing. Um, one is doing uh, sensor networks trying to support field scientists. One is working on ethics, ethics education in computing degree programs. Um, and two are working on things that I'm going to talk about today that are a mix actually of networking and, and HCI. So my, my group mix now is kind of represents many of these, of these phases of the work that I've done. But definitely my kind of traditional networking student count, head count has declined. All right. So I also wanted to put up this slide, um, uh, which is about how research careers have ebbs and flows. Probably all of you who've been at this for a while have a graph <laughs> that looks something like this. You know, the number of, uh, of people whose, whose citation graph goes like this, you know, it, it's almost nobody, right? And I think I gave a talk, I put the slide in a talk, and I also pulled the chart for another one of the speakers without the y-axis. and. You know, basically, it was the same thing. This was somebody whose y-axis is higher. <laughs> but still, you know, no matter where you are, these, these things come and go. Uh, so that's something for maybe the younger people in the audience. Um, 
Okay, so I, I kind of think of my phase four under this name, it's not, I don't know that it's a great name, but I don't have a better one, of human-centered networking. And so a working definition for that is when you can't abstract away the human or the community or the societal considerations. You can't abstract them away into an equation or, or, a, or a model, not even your super duper ML model. Okay, you can't abstract them away. So you have to do the work in consideration of the fact that there are humans, you know, in the system. And so, uh, you know, we've, most of you, you know, have seen this. Well, you recognize the stack for sure, the OSI ISO stack that we, we diss every time we teach networking, right? Like, it's not seven layers, it's five. Uh, and then some of these layers that you could think of as above layer seven, above the application layer. And I'm seeing baby steps in this direction in the networking community, which makes me extremely happy. Um, you know, you could think of, uh, uh, you know, as we've moved from talking about quality of service to quality of experience, that's a step towards recognizing that what really matters to people experiencing an application is their experience, what they perceive is the experience, not you know, what the quality of service metrics are. You tell them quality of service metrics, you know, why do I care about that? Um, another area I see this happening is that you we start to see papers that have done uh, user studies. Did anybody do a user study in their paper that's in this conference? All right, okay, so it's starting to happen. People are starting to learn what it means to write a human subjects protocol. Uh, um, yeah, I, 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 was just, I was just talking to, uh, uh, Mustafa and I were talking with our student who's doing the video conferencing and she'd done some experiments and uh, shame on me, Mustafa said, well, Ellen, do we, because he considers me the expert, uh, do, you, do we need IRB for this? I was like, Whoa, we might, and then he, said, then he said, we're gonna have to change the experiment because <laughs> I don't wanna have to get IRB certification. I'm like, no, no, we, we're not gonna change the experiment. I'll hold your hand, I'll show you all the ways to get through it quickly, or without, with, as little, with less pain. I can't say no pain, less pain. And most recently in this little list, uh, at the SIGCOM conference in New York two weeks ago, three weeks ago, there was an actual paper session, the whole session, with the title Equity. And that, I mean, that like, gives me the chills because I am so happy to see that happening. All right, and if you think in terms of disciplines, you know, this work is, is in the intersection of the tr you know, traditional disciplines in computing of networking and HCI, um, but it also reaches outside of computer science into things like public policy, law, economics, and you'll see that in some of what I'm gonna talk about. Okay, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about, uh, within human-centered networking, a topic that I've been working on for several years now, which has to do with internet access and, and digital divides. And um, I guess I'll say up front that, uh, you know, particularly when public policy is an element, uh, a lot of this, this work has been very much focused on being done in the U.S., but I know that these, many of these issues exist in other countries, so you'll have to, you know, extrapolate. And I've often gotten questions about whether some of the tools that we are developing could be used outside the U.S., and the answer is I'm pretty sure yes in many places, although we ourselves have not tried to do that. So let me just caveat the little bit of a U.S.-centric um, focus. Okay, so let's talk about broadband access 101. So when we talk about access, um, we're really talking about the, the last mile between a user's device and the internet. It's called a mile, but actually sometimes it's much longer than a mile. Um, it's just, a con I guess, a convenient terminology. You know something funny? I can see my slides in the mirror back there although they're reversed. So um, I, I feel like I have a, a guide. I mean, there's some on the laptop too, but I'm, I'm, I'm like, except that my brain is getting mixed around. I can, I can use the mirror image. Anyway, um, okay, and, and there are lots, you know, the last mile, just like we know, the expanded waste below the, 
below the narrow waist, the expansion. There's just lots of exciting technologies for last mile access. Um, uh, one characteristic of many of them is that they're, they're spectrum constrained. Well, the wireless ones are, are spectrum constrained. So immediately you have public policy in there, right? As soon as you talk about spectrum constraint, you have to talk about who's, what government agency has dictated what spectrum can be used for what purposes. Um, we have fixed broadband access, right? Where the, it's a fixed location technology and we have mobile broadband. Uh, where it's a mobile location technology. And I'm mostly going to be talking about mobile broadband, um, cellular, recently satellite. Um, and this term broadband is itself a contested term, a political term. Um, it doesn't seem to us like broadband would be a political word, but it is because when you talk about things like broadband for all or digital equity, you have to say what the speeds are that count as broadband. And if I am in a position to, just to, to, to dictate the speeds and I want things to look good, I'll just pick lower speeds. I'll say, well, you know, uh, five megabits per second, upload one megabit per second, download, that's broadband. Now let, let me tell you how great I've done in providing, how great the situation is. Everybody has broadband. So this, even these definitions start to touch on these political, these political layers. So, you know, is it minimum or median? Is it advertised or measured? That's a big one, right? Like your provider tells you, oh, you have 100 megabits per second. You measure, you never, ever, ever get that, right? Is it, you know, and, and importantly here, fixed and mobile are just completely not the same thing. And lots of discussions about broadband access are not very, People are not very specific about which one they're talking about. It makes a gigantic difference. Um, in the US, the Federal Communication Commission defines broadband. Um, and, uh, and, and here's some numbers, although these are evolving, okay? As, because what, okay, here's the quality of experience piece, right? You could have a quality of service of these numbers, but as applications cha mix changes, as people do more from home, what works, what sets, what's sufficient for your needs is of course evolving and so they change these definitions. There's also categories used like a region being served, meaning it meets the minimum, it meets the debt specification. Unserved means there is no option. And underserved, which is a really important category, there's service. So it's not that there's no service, but the service doesn't meet the definition. So that, those regions are called underserved. And of course there's deployment, and adoption, and these are different. Deployment means access is available. Adoption means customers have found it affordable. Um, and so those are, those are other, other distinctions. Okay, so um, uh, one of the ways I got involved in this project or a, 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 a community that I've done some work with is, in, is called Concord, Georgia. So I'm from Atlanta. Atlanta's a big city. Probably many of you flew through Atlanta on your way here. Uh, Concord, Georgia is only about a two hour drive south of Atlanta. I, that's pretty close to a, major, a very major metropolitan city. And I was actually stunned to find out how little broadband access opportunities to buy people in Concord have. They have almost no options. Um, it's a small town. I kind of love how, you know, Grandpa Towing, this, here, I'm gonna try using the little, look at this. This is Grandpa Towing, okay? <laughs> Grandpa has a towing company. Uh, there's the Baptist Church, that's par for the course in the south of the US. There's a post office, there's something called the Woodyard. Um, it has a weird shape to it, don't ask me why, you know, this funny part is up here. But it's a small, it's a small town, has a thousand something population, and, um, and they have been building their own network. You can, it's a little hard to see in this picture, but this is, um, this is ubiquity equipment. Um, so this is a, a fixed wireless solution that they have put in place because they have no options. Um, so this is a kind of ground truth for what I'm talking about when I'm talking about access and, and in this case, basically uns, unserved. Um, okay, so there's a whole line. Hm. 
I guess I can't get that guy to go away. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of research questions in, in this space. So things like um, understanding where there are access problems. How do we know where people, and, and okay, so now I want you to keep in mind mobile, okay, mobile. How do we know where access problems exist? Um, and it's not as simple as saying, I mean, you know, you've got T-Mobile, they'll tell you, we provide coverage in this area. Do they? That, that uh, you know, if, if you're very close to one of their towers, sure. But as you move further away, their assurance to you that they have coverage becomes uh, suspect. Um, you know, how would we know? How would we know where there's coverage? Who's collecting this data? Who are they sharing it with? Where does that data about coverage come from? Uh, you know, okay, then what, what don't we know? And I'll say a little bit about that. Why does it matter? Uh, I mean, that's sort of obvious, but there's also a timeliness at the moment in the US related to investment of funds in broadband. <coughs> and then kind of, you know, now we, hopefully you'll wanna know what you, what you can do. Uh, and so I'll give you some, tell you a little bit about that. So here's a slide, I'm gonna show you two slides about where problems exist. Um, so uh, this, uh, this story is really interesting. Uh, this is about fixed, so I'm switching to fixed just briefly. So this is an article, bad broadband maps are keeping people offline and everyone knows it. So this is a case of an island off the coast of Maine called Deer Island and um, there was an incumbent, a provider, Spectrum, and they claimed that they covered the island. Why is that important? I mean, first off, so it was important because they were trying to prevent other providers from coming in, from being able to come in, getting funds to help expand coverage. So if you have limited funds and there's a provider in a location, you probably wanna spend your funds somewhere else. So Spectrum was keeping out the competition by claiming that they had provided access all over the island, but the residents knew this was not true. So on the left-hand side is what Spectrum claimed about where they, any place in that red, you could call up Spectrum and you could, get, you could, you could purchase uh, connectivity. The mayor of this map, the, sorry, the, the mayor of the map, the mayor of the town had a PhD in GIS mapping. Okay, this is really bizarre, right? This is, I mean, this is Maine. This is like, uh, uh, and, and he, was, he said, um, this isn't true. So he went on the Facebook page, he said, everybody contribute whether you have access to cable internet. And he collected these data points where people did not have access. Um, and so, you know, you see these two pictures and, and um, you know, the trunk lines are there. And uh, it, was a, it was a really um, powerful crowdsourced data set to counter the claims of a provider. And that is the game that happens in, in broadband that, um, you know, communities have experiences which are not what providers are saying. And so crowdsourced data is extremely, extremely powerful. Um, another example, and this is again coming from, you'll see Concord, you'll see Concord right there. Uh, um, and this is uh, about the broadband availability um, showing, and this is also fixed. So I guess I lied when I said I was gonna focus on mobile. I mean, I am, but there's more fixed in here than I had remembered. So this is showing locations where you can get 25 megabits per second down and three megabits per second up. Um, and the orange is the areas that are served and the um, light orange, this is maybe not designed by the world's best visualization person, but the little, the, the, or, the light color is unserved and the gray is that nobody, there are no addresses there. They're mostly lakes, I believe. Um, and then there's been some new movement and these, these blue areas are where there's some new, new movement. But you can see, here's Concord, like the whole, the whole county, Pike County, is basically unserved. Um, and again, as I said, this is very close to Atlanta. Um, so this was a map that the state, so many states have undertaken um, mapping efforts because the uh, official maps are so inaccurate. Um, I thought I might have, okay, I guess I don't. 
So that's the, that's the situation, and this is relatively accurate. The states have been doing quite a good job in mapping availability. Um, okay, so, so now, you know, how do we know about, about data, and who's doing this collection? So I alluded to um, crowdsourced data. So users are monitoring their own performance, oftentimes to hold providers account, sometimes for curiosity. How many people have used a speed test? And you mostly do it when it's bad, right? Um, so people run speed tests when they're frustrated because they want to know that they're right to be frustrated. Um, <laughs> uh, some of those measurements contribute to crowdsourced efforts. Some of them you just sit there feeling, I don't know, vindicated or whatever in your outrage. Um, so users making measurements, this is actually the gold standard because it's at the point in time, at the point in location, it's, the, it's what you're actually experiencing. Um, providers make measurements. In the US, they're required to submit a form to the FCC saying where their coverage is. So they actually are required to, to, to report this. But you know, to give them some credit, you can appreciate, say you're a mobile provider, you're T-Mobile. And now you're supposed to provide these shape files saying where T-Mobile can be accessed. It's just a fundamentally hard problem. You could use radio propagation models from your towers, but those are for sure going to be limited. And um, it seems to be somewhat in providers' interests to overstate a bit. Um, so it's a fundamentally hard problem. Um, the government does some measuring, some aggregating of data. They're actually required by people who didn't know how hard this problem was. Um, to, to keep data, accurate data. Location services companies are a really interesting case. They crowdsource, but they keep it all proprietary. So they um, embed, embed location services in applications that report connectivity data, and then they use that to enhance their service, but you can't, we can't get access, typically, to that data. Um, and then researchers. When researchers do these measurements, they typically do it in very hyper-local locations for, for obvious reasons that you, have to, you would have to travel. The costs associated with making measurements on any large-scale basis are substantial. Um, and so researchers are usually getting kind of hyper-local ground truth. Um, here's, a, here's an example uh, showing the limitations of what the government data set, of the government data sets. And these, as I said, these are, the provider has told the federal government where their coverage is, and then the federal government turns around and makes a map. So here's a case, this is the state of Georgia, um, and the left-hand side is what the FCC, the, the official government map for fixed 25-3, um, and you see a lot of orange. Remember, the orange is covered, the, is, is well served. Uh, the one on the right, the Georgia broadband map, two years later, so um, if anything, it should be better than it was in 2020, two years later, this is the map that they that was produced in the Georgia effort, and I mean, this is just so striking. This difference in how much orange there is. There is a little bit of a um, there's a caveat here, so uh, which makes in the FCC case for a census block, a geography. If one address in that geography was covered, the provider got to count it as covered, um, and that's not the definition used in the right hand side. It's an eighty percent had to be covered. So you're losing some based on this different definition, but, but this, this is super striking how different this data is. Um, this is an example of crowdsource data from the, the company Ookla, uh, and this is fixed data, and there's a kind of scale here from less good is lighter colored and better is red. This is fixed coverage, and I've zoned in on Concord's <coughs> region. Um, and, and this is where any UCLA block that had two or more measurements, we threw out the ones that had only a single crowdsource measurement. And then if you look at mobile, it just completely goes to hell. The um, coverage is just, is just terrible according to these crowdsource measurements. Okay, so, so here's some kind of conclusions out of that um, line of research. Access is severely lacking in many locations 
this is country specific. So you know, there are countries of the world where access is better than the US. There are certainly countries in the world where the access is much worse than in the US, but, but including in the US. There are places where it's severely lacking. The data is inaccurate, especially if we talk about performance data. That data is very sparse, um, and mobile is in a infancy compared to fixed in terms of performance data, and, and kind of we don't always know what we don't know. So here's an example of <laughs> what we don't know. So this is, a, this is a project where we were able to get access to the uh, data of a location services company. There happened to be, it was a company called Skyhook, the, somebody high up in the, in the organization was a Georgia Tech grad, and we happened to be chatting, and he said, I think I can get you access to this data. So this is comparing what Skyhook's crowdsourced data says about whether um, Verizon Cellular has coverage in New Mexico. And it's comparing to what the FCC data says. That's reported by, reported by the provider. And what's interesting here is, okay, there's four colors in this picture, in this map: uh, light blue and dark blue, uh, purple and orange. Um, and these are all four combinations of, okay, we've got two data sets. They could both agree that a region has coverage. In that case, it's orange. They could both, oh, sorry, they could agree it was uncovered, that's orange. They could agree that there was coverage, that's blue. So blue is the biggest one, so in quite a few parts of New Mexico, everybody agrees that Verizon has coverage. The orange, everybody agrees Verizon does not cover. But then both options of the, of the one says yes, one says no, both of these options are present in this data set. So um, in the purple, the FCC has said the region is covered. We expect these to be bigger because we expect providers to overstate their coverage. So these purple regions, the Skyhook data set says this is not a covered region. And then the dark blue, which is a much smaller geography, is the opposite. Sky, the FCC says there's no coverage here, or Verizon says there's no coverage here, but the Skyhook data set indicates there is. And it makes sense that you see these purple regions and these blue regions in transition, right? Like you have places that are uncovered and you have places that are covered. Of course, as you transition from one to the other, that's where it's much harder to say what the ground truth is. And that's why you, know, you see these purple regions uh, surrounding an orange, right? And on the way to blue. So, um, so this is a very interesting demonstration of the challenge of knowing the ground truth and also limitations basically actually of both types of data sets, but you'll see that the, the, there's many more cases where the FCC is claiming coverage while Skyhook is claiming uncovered. This is another, this is two more providers. The provider matters naturally, AT&T, it's terrible in New Mexico. <laughs> T-Mobile is, is pretty good. Um, okay, so there's a bunch of myths about the data that's out there, including we have everything we need, uh, access only, problems only happen in rural areas. I haven't really convinced you of that, but, but it is true that access problems exist in urban areas as well. Uh, cellular providers know their coverage accurately. I've had people push back on me on this one and say, you know, maybe they do know and they're just not saying, but I, I actually don't think so because of the fundamental challenge of the data measurement problem. I'm not sure how, if they were going to really know, they would have to be in the field measuring in lots of places and I, I don't think that they would find it cost effective to do that. I can't think of any reason why it would be in their business interest to have fine grain data about where they cover or don't cover. You know, the FCC knows everything. Speed test, all we need is speed test. And then a last one um, about 5G or 6G, like if we just wait a while. So this is a common, a common answer to equity issues. Just wait longer. All right, there's a very good chance that future technologies 
widen the, the gap. That's what equity is about. Equity is about gaps. Widen the gap, not narrow the gap. Um, this, this is an UCLA picture about presence of 5G in the African continent and you know, this, there's like one point here in Ghana. Liberia, just for your interest, uh, happens to be right down there uh, with no, no points. So um, waiting for better technologies, and I mean, we all like to work on better technologies. It's kind of a way, I think, of, you know, you can think about, well, maybe I'm helping solve this problem because I'm working on better technologies, faster. But remember, equity is about a gap. It's not about it's not about where the top end is. Uh, okay, so why does this matter? Well, this is the obvious one. I mean, people want to use the internet for important stuff, like for fun and for healthcare and for school, you know, and for remote work, all the things. Um, and this is a study, again, in Maine about household uses, and basically the uses are the same in the islands that did not have good coverage and the islands that do. Like, it doesn't, you still want to do the same kinds of things. Um, and in the U.S. in particular, I alluded, alluded to this, there's a reason why this is important right now, and that's because a huge amount of funding is coming over this blue transom to communities. Um, so the, uh, uh, in the Biden administration, there was a large allocation of funding to improve broadband. And now the question is, where should that funding go? And you know, the, the, the funding opportunity description says, funding is distributed primarily based on the relative number of unserved locations. Okay, but we just saw that it's really hard to know with accuracy where the unserved locations are. I mean, yes, we can know a lot of them, so I'm not saying that there's no, no useful data to use to make these decisions. But here is a huge amount of money being distributed according to data that we know has all kinds of limitations to it. Um, uh, and so the FCC released a map that then what they did was, since they couldn't, they released a pre-production draft. This begins the challenge process. Okay, what is the challenge process? The challenge process is um, uh, how we, in our spare time, can help the FCC make a better map. Is that what you want to be spending your time on? Actually, we might want to, because we are geeks, and uh, we like the idea of accurate maps. But the communities that need this, trust me, they, don't want to spend their spare time improving the government's maps for free, right? Crowdsourced labor, generally crowdsourced labor is unpaid labor. So, you know, now we're, the government is essentially asking people in communities that are underserved to do the work to prove that they're underserved so that they can then get resources. So this is a very, uh, um, unfortunate situation. So there's a challenge process. Individuals, governments, other entities can challenge the accuracy of the data. Let me tell you a little bit about what it takes to challenge the accuracy of the data. There is a 150 page document, 150 pages, on uh, how to challenge provider claims of coverage. And Sharif was joking that if I wanted to walk around, he could carry the he could carry this because I don't have a pocket, you know. And he was <laughs> he was saying, you know, like a grad student, you know, would follow around the advisor doing whatever the advisor wants. Okay, so here's my my grad student went through this 150 page document. This is a policy document, okay? This is a government policy document. My grad student went through the whole thing and created. And if you're interested, I'll can give you a pointer. I can even maybe I'll put it on the slide before. Well, if you publish the slides. Anyway, it's not in the slides. I should put it there. He created a flow chart of what it takes to challenge a mobile provider. Um, and he, it's a blog post, and he did an awesome job. There's all these like flow chart parts that open up at different places. But that was necessary because the thing, the conditions are so complicated. Okay? So in this one paragraph 50 
a resolution eight hexagon will, as proposed, be challenged when tests submitted within the hexagon meet three thresholds, geographic, temporal, and testing, footnote number 204. So my husband's a lawyer. Um, this is how lawyers write things. They have lots of footnotes and they have things like, I don't know, as proposed. So there's a hexagon, there's a concept of hexagons. There's a concept of geogra geography and time and um, testing, whatever testing means. A little more data to satisfy the geographic threshold. Okay, so we're only talking about the geographic threshold. In general, why do you have this? In, anyway, in general, at least four child hexagons, referred to as point hexes, which to me this sounds like black magic, like isn't a point hex something that a wizard or a would do? Uh, within the resolution eight hexagon have to contain two of the same test components, one of which is negative. Okay, so you can see here, like this is painful to read. This is super painful to read. Um, now who is gonna read something like this? Who wants to read this to be able to do a challenge? Nobody. So my student Jason Cox digested all of this and made this beautiful flow chart for what it takes to have a challenge. Uh, and um, we are working on, this is the FCC's version. We are working on, and we're quite close to having the alpha version ready to test and release of an application called CellWatch, which allows people to take measurements in support of a challenge. The FCC also has released an app uh, built by Sam Knows, which is a company that FCC has used for other kinds of things. But notably, okay, uh, this is not an open source app. Sam Knows makes money off of creating these tools. So the FCC's app will not be open source. Ours will be open source. Um, and, you know, it, it anyway. Uh, so, so we're working, actually now if you think about it, it's really an ecosystem. So CellWatch, the application, uh, right. it's an Android client app. It could be used by citizens. It could be used by researchers. It has a back end that can report to the FCC. But we also have been focusing on something we're calling a community coordination tool. So if you're gonna try to mount one of these challenges, you have a bunch of requirements about how many measurements you've taken, in which locations, and at what times of day. So let's say I'm a community that wants to challenge. How would I coordinate that? Like, all right, how about you go out tomorrow morning between 6 and 10 a.m. because we know that we're close to meeting the threshold for the challenge in this place and you live near there or you're gonna drive through there on your way to work. So why don't you go make that measurement? And you know, we think there might be some problems over here but we haven't taken any measurements yet so I'll go over there on Saturday because it's next to my kid's soccer game. You know, th this, is, this is the work of coordinating community measurements. And so we're working on tools to help support that, that would give good visualizations and data to help communities understand where they are in meeting this challenge threshold. The FCC's tools will not do that. For the F in the FCC's tools, you take measurements and then on the back end, they figure out if you had enough measurements to meet a challenge threshold. That's, that's okay, but if you wanna really be proactive, you'd like to know where you are in meeting that challenge. You don't wanna wait a month or whatever the delay is for the FCC to come back and tell you. So we're working on this, on this uh, um, uh, ecosystem, and it includes uh, some ML work with some colleagues in industrial and systems engineering to do prediction. So, you know, we're never going to measure everywhere, so prediction is really interesting. This is an example of just uh, uh, a small part of this flowchart. Um, I won't leave it up. Oh, there is, I did, there is a blog link. Okay, so now you all can see the link if you want to. It's really an excellent blog post. Um, you did an amazing job. Our UI UX, I just wanted to show you, it will, sh it will have mapping. Okay, the FCC one doesn't have mapping. It will have mapping. And it will show you this hexagon overlay. This is something that Uber developed to tile the globe. Um, so the hexagon-based overlay, which is the central element of the challenge, and here's the, here's the point hexes. <laughs> there are seven point hexes inside a hexagon. So this is just to give you a flavor. We're trying to do a good UI design and interact with users and write IRB protocols. Uh, um, this is an example of us out in the field making measurements. This is um, three phones from each of three providers 
in New Mexico, driving around. We wanted to take measurements, uh, and we wanted to try to take them in places where they would have the most value. So that's actually a whole other research question. How do you plan a measurement campaign? How do you decide where it would be most valuable to measure? Um, and that we were trying to take into account things like population and terrain and existing data. Like if there's existing data, we would deprioritize. Um, and one slide about cell wall, the prediction quality. I, this is uh, um, my ML colleagues. I'll just say for those of you who would understand this better. What we found is that the Gaussian model is challenging to use. So the data has some particularly uh, difficult characteristics, including highly unbalanced. So many measurements in some locations and very few measurements in others. Um, also, the data tends to be quite noisy, and the value of quality of the connection <coughs> ranges over, uh, has, has a wide variance to it. So um, this self-tuning bandwidth kernel regression method is able to adapt to the sparsity of the data, um, and we've been using it to make coverage predictions um, and, and seeing some really interesting and good results. Uh, okay, so digital divide is an equity issue. It's complicated. COVID made it really, brought it to the fore. Um, all right. So I wanted to end by just talking a little bit about um, how to choose problems to work on. And all, th all four of these are examples. You know, we're networking people, right? We, we naturally think across boundaries. We naturally, you know, if, when you teach networking, undergrad networking, one of the hardest things for students to understand is uh, the, how long it takes for a packet to get from one location to another. Why? Because it's the first time they take a class where stuff doesn't happen in the same location. So the fact that a bit has to travel and that takes time, they've never seen that before. They've basically never seen that. And then you blow their mind by saying, you know, the delay is the sum of the propagation delay and the transmission time. And they're like, what? What is the, so um, I always walk across the stage when I'm talking, I'm like, and then the other bits, you know, they're right behind me, right? Like I'm get to here and then the other bits are right behind me. So then each of them, off the line, but still, it's incredibly hard for them to understand because they previously, everything is running on a single machine, at least where networking falls in our undergrad curriculum. It's the first time that they have to deal with geography. But this is what we think about all the time. We're always thinking about things happening over space, not just over time. And so we know things are deeply interconnected and there's deep relationships between what's happening in one place and happening in another place. COVID probably the most stunning example that in most people's you know, lifetime of interconnectedness. Um, so, uh, all right, so thinking about things like what are the real broader, broader impacts is NSF language. Um, when you write a proposal, you have to talk about the broader impacts. Thinking, I would say, elevating the importance of what the broader impacts are in choosing problems. Um, Keshev, as some of you will know, uh, University of Cambridge gave a wonderful talk where he said, if you're trying to find a problem to solve, look on the front page of the newspaper. I mean, he's basically saying, find out what is happening in the real world and then think about how your skills, talents, interests might align with that. Um, for me, I'm kind of trying to encourage the community to move towards layer eight. Um, and I wanted to share something I, I really liked in a recent um, NSF workshop. Scott Schenker, uh, so he, he, he said, you know, let's talk about expected impact of work. So the expected impact is the probability that you actually are successful, that you have impact. Uh, times how much difference gets made if you're successful, okay? And we very, very often um, dismiss work when we think that it's not likely to be successful. We like, forget it, you know, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna accept this paper, we're not gonna fund this proposal, I don't think this can work. I don't think this can, you know, I don't think this, there's no deployment path. And the, the point here is, okay, 
for some work that is definitely, I mean, we do need to think about that. Okay, that's, that's not to, it's not that we don't think about that. But if something's being proposed, and sh if it were successful, it would have huge impact, that we might use to sort of change the balance of how we think about these two things. We, we, we invest in a lot of work that pretty likely to be successful, but it will make a kind of incremental difference. All right, some of that work we should fund, but, but you know, let's also look at work where the probability of successful is a little bit lower, but the what difference would it make is a little bit higher. Okay, so that's a soapbox kind of a, of a, a, a you know, anti-conservatism in, in, in what we support. Okay, finally, um, let me say a little bit about the last thing I've been doing, latest thing. So National Science Foundation, I kind of already said this. I wanted to, Sharif pointed out to me that, because uh, originally I said, oh, I'll talk about the National Science Foundation. She feels like, that'd be great. Um, lots of people in the audience <laughs> will be interested in something other than the US funding situation. I didn't realize, right, of course, that's right. So uh, I wanted to mention that one thing that's happened at the, US, at, the, at the NSF that I really had not paid attention to as a PI is increasing opportunities to help us work with one another, to help US researchers and researchers in other countries be able to collaborate and be able to apply for funding that would help support um, in, both, in, in both countries. And so there's a relatively new US-India agreement there is a US France, there's been a long standing US Israel, and there are others under discussion. So I wanted to encourage you if you have not, if it has not been on your radar that your country might have a funding opportunity that's linked to a funding opportunity in the US or elsewhere, I mean, I, this is my NSF hat, but know that these are happening and more of them are happening all the time. I've really been blown away by um, the kind of you know, understanding the NSF world beyond the part that I had tapped into myself. I've never applied for, for funding under any of these other kind of these collaborative things. And I think they're becoming much more practical. Like I think sometimes we had them where, all right, it would fund travel. I mean, travel's important, but travel's not enough to have the collaboration work. So, so you know, I encourage you, especially, you know, in this case, if you have US folks you'd like to collaborate with to look into these possibilities. Um, US Canada, yeah, yeah. So I, I knew there were more, yes, okay, US Canada, thank you. And if you're from the US, just I wanna encourage you that um, you shouldn't think of NSF, and I don't know if this applies in other science agencies, but you could try it, I don't think it will hurt. Um, you shouldn't think of NSF as like a wall that you throw your proposals over and the answers come back. The, Program managers are like, they're, they're, they are, they're not a wall, they're just lined up waiting to talk to you, okay? They seriously are lined up waiting to talk to you. And the things that they can talk to you about, um, you know, uh, can be really valuable, all right? So don't, um, I think increasing your chances of having your good idea become a great idea in the funding part of it, if you talk to these folks, they will help. They, they, they'll talk about, uh, there's a phrase called, um, a, a, a description of a proposal called, it panels well. It panels well. What does that mean? And, and NSF, the panel, the peer review panel, is the linchpin of the merit review process. People like, you know, regular people like us going in, reading proposals, and categorizing them on their competitiveness. That's the panel process. And people, they discuss the proposals, they reach an agreement. A proposal to panel well means it succeeds in that environment. That's a very specific environment, right? Of discussion and um, so, uh, you know, you, you can take your idea and with help, with some input, you could probably figure out how to get it to panel as well as possible, and you wouldn't necessarily know what exactly to be done. Now, if you've served on panels, you have a bit of an idea, but, but still, these folks are watching these discussions happen all the time. They're in the room, they know a ton about how the discussions tend to go, and they can share some of that with you to help you improve your proposals. All right, I think I have one more slide, and then I'll stop. Uh, so, um, in Concord, uh, this is two examples of where um, uh, 
you know, the models for whether the network was going to work failed. Okay. The one on the left hand side, my students were driving around Concord with, uh, uh, it was either the mayor or the guy that runs the water who cares a lot about connectivity for having water meter, automated water me reader meeting, re readings. They had to stop and cut down that bush <laughs> because the bush was interfering with the line of sight ubiquity transmission that's the basis for the network in this community. Does anybody recognize the figure on the right? I wouldn't have. I just know what it is. happen to know what it is. What's that? Tom Petty. Oh, <laughs> Uh, it's The Walking Dead. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a, a filming scene. They filmed an episode of The Walking Dead. Um, I mean, it does look Pompeii-like for sure. An episode of The Walking Dead, they filmed it in Concord. And um, one day during the filming, the mayor's internet stopped working. Turns out they had parked these large production trucks Right? They have to bring like all the props and all the cameras. They parked one of these large production trucks in the line of sight of the connectivity to the mayor's house. So, you know, these ground truth things <laughs> are, these are so local and, uh, you know, really helps to illustrate the challenge of, um, of mapping and the challenges of, of providing connectivity, especially if you're going for solutions that have some fragility to them, which is basically the case in this, uh, in this ubiquity technology. All right, thank you all for listening. Um, I've listed a number of the students and collaborators who worked on the pieces that I talked about um, and uh, would be remiss not to thank the National Science Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, and um, my Fleming Endowed Chair funds that have helped support the research. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. <laughs>
thing you work on, thinking about what would happen if it were deployed in a place where latencies are higher than the ones that you're thinking about. You know, bandwidths are lower or the network is less reliable. Sometimes it doesn't work, right? So kind of those set of considerations, if we take those things into consideration and other problems and solutions, you know, we're building something more robust for everyone and we're also, you know, trying to kind of be aware of this gap and, and, and when you can do things that would help bring up, you know, all ships to, to do that. But I think it is very, you know, I worked with communities where they were hoping, you know, you're from Georgia Tech, that's a, you know, bring us the technology, you know, that solves our problem. And, and the, the, I mean, it's not there. It's not, uh, uh, it's not there yet. Yeah. So I actually have a question. Yes. So we have a, quite a large mix of people, you know, early career for all the way from PhD students all the way to people with stellar careers. So what are your two biggest pieces of advice you would give to, you know, junior people think they're just finishing up their PhD, starting up their career? And two pieces of advice for those who are <laughs> mid-career. I'm getting greedy. But those especially who like might hit a plateau of getting in the cycle of, you know, I'm just looking for a problem that can get funded. I have yeah. students, things are plateauing, yeah. but now they're looking for the next challenge because you've gone through many of these transitions of let's explore new things. Right. So right. what two pieces of yeah. advice for both career stages? Okay. So the the mid career one, I think I so I think at that stage, um, you really want to think about your research portfolio, right? You don't have to make everything risky and new, and you're not sure how it's going to get funded. But you can do some things like that, um, you know, to use the, to you, and, and, and as I said, when I first sort of wanted to try to do work that had more, I felt was more connected to immediate pressing social problems, I couldn't figure out how to do it. I couldn't figure out what research I was going to do. Um, and this project-based class was really a wonderful way to, to see some problem domains, to try to do some work with students. And then, you know, because we're researchers, once we start doing these things, we start thinking about, okay, if I abstract away from this particular nonprofit's challenge in this particular location, I can abstract away from that and say, oh, look, that's an instance of a problem that's much more general and that I might try to tackle in its abstracted form because that's what we do as researchers. So I would say looking for ways to, to take, you know, to do a little bit of your portfolio, have a bit of your portfolio be in the new direction. Also taking a sabbatical if you're in a place where that's possible. I was, a, I, I failed at sabbaticals. Um, I had this, this older faculty member once say to me, in, in, in honesty, he said, shame on you. And I told him that I hadn't taken a sabbatical. So, you know, these are there for a reason, a chance to step away from everything. Um, and also collaborators. I think that's the other, my, this Liberia work and my publishing there happened in the conference called ICTD, Information and Communication Technologies and Development, Political, Social, Economic Development. So I had a friend who was working in that space. And when I started, when I had the chance to go to Liberia, he had actually worked in Liberia a couple times. He's not a networking person by any means. But I'm not sure I would have gone if I didn't know him. Um, there's an amazing movie about the Civil War in Liberia called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Um, it's about how the women in Liberia forced the end of the Civil War. And I watched it before I went. My husband watched it. He's like, that's where you're going? <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be fine. I, I don't think I would have gone, actually, if it weren't for him. And he really introduced me to this other publishing uh, research community, which had very different ways of doing things than we have in networking. So, you know, these are, like, you can, cr you can creep in those directions. Um, I also learned about something at NSF, which we don't have in computer science, but we're talking about it, um, which are mid-career Funding, funding for people at the, exactly for their, you know, maybe you want to become a, more of an ML expert. 
but how, you know, but we're doing all our things, and where's the time that we're going to try to fit in becoming an ML expert? So funding, you know, look, you could look for funding programs that try to help make it possible. Sabbatical is one for mid-career people to go gain skills and you know that would let them make a transition because things are you know things are moving so fast that the kind of skills that got us where we are, you know. After a while, they are they get rusty. Um, for new people, you know, I think the one thing I would say is just watch out for the bandwagons because we really are subject to bandwagons in networking. Maybe this is true across. You know, I don't I don't think it's us in particular, but you know, uh, if you if you analyze the the subject matter of papers, say, in conferences over time, you'll just see these, you know, these big waves of, and, um, you know, thinking about, like, you don't necessarily need to join a big wave. If you have a great idea, sure, but there's lots of important work that is not the bandwagon work, and so kind of um, just being, yeah, being aware of that. Don't you know, don't judge the quality of work and topics by the citation count all the time. Because things get high citation counts because lots of people are writing papers in that area. And, um, you know, it doesn't, I mean, it's an indicator of the quality of a paper, but it's not the whole story by any means. That, that, that internet topology modeling, that project came about because, so this I guess, junior person, like I was reading a paper and I was like taking, you know, I was taking notes about it and I, it just was a light bulb moment that these models, these random graph models were, had none of the structure of the internet. They, they just assumed that you would lay nodes, routers out in a 2D space and then you would connect two of them with probability P. That's the basic random graph model. This is not what the internet looks like, right? So, and actually this was before all the things about like people understanding um, uh, like power law distributions and connectivity. It was a little bit before, anyway. So I think um, just, it's good to know what the bandwagons are. You know, you can get on them if you have a great idea or you're just really find that topic fascinating, but don't feel that you have to. Other questions? Dr. Kamen. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ellen, uh, for the insightful talk. Uh, just the follow up on uh, Sherry's question and on your story. Um, I, I think I was like that, I, like you, uh, when I became tenured and then full professor. Uh, <coughs> Uh, after, you know, passing through those, those you know, grants, publications, etc., and I, I told myself that okay, I guess it's time to do some research that will help society. <laughs> I mean, eventually, of course, what we do uh, may uh, eventually impact society, but I want to do something that really uh, shows immediate uh, impact. And what you described here. Uh, was a perfect example uh, of that. Um, so I wanted to help people. I wanted to help the like community equity. That you know, those those kind of stuff. But um, I mean, it has been a while, and and uh, I, I guess uh, the environment that we are in here is uh, you know, it's driven by capitalism, right? Money. Uh, so you still need to publish. You still need to get funded. If you work with companies, uh, they are also that you know worse mindset. Uh, so still, I guess the the challenge is that you don't have resources, uh, you don't have time, you you don't have connections. So I guess the question is, uh, are there maybe the government would not do this, but maybe the foundations that you're uh, listing there uh, are there um, resources like foundations or intermediary organizations? Who would be interested in, in funding or giving resources for people who would like to work really with communities and, and yeah. make impact, immediate impact? Yeah, yeah. so uh, it's hard. I, I, I'm you know, not going to tell you otherwise. In the, in the U.S., the NSF has had 
uh, uh, solicitation called Smart and Connected right. Communities. Um, I think that is a really um, admirable effort to try to provide funding that connects researchers with community organizations. Yeah, and um, you know, uh, if you have ideas about what might come after that, you should get in touch with NSF and share those ideas. It is absolutely hard and, and um, to get the resources that, I mean, it's hard, on, it's hard to get the resources and then a piece that I think I'm hoping, you know, we collectively can start to change is the reception that that work receives when you submit it to conferences, right? Because that's another piece that's hard. Um, but that's under our control. We are on these PCs. We are making recommendations. So that's why I was so excited about that equity session at CINCOM. Um, uh, you know, foundations do a lot of the important um, resource provision for problems that the private sector does not see uh, in line with their, um, you know, their mission and their and their, uh, uh, you know, their financial considerations. So foundations are a source, and depending on where you are, kind of checking out the foundation landscape. It's not a landscape that we, you know, when you're and this is me for sure. Like NSF is the bread and butter. Right, we, we know how to do that. You all in other places will know how to apply for your traditional funding, vent, funding avenues. Um, but, uh, you know, starting to have some conversations. So I, I'll tell you something about that Rockefeller Foundation Award. We wrote that paper about the, the data sets, like the FCC data set and the Skyhook data set, and then we had taken some ground truth measurements. And we, I think, I can't remember if we'd, we probably submitted it to some traditional networking conferences and didn't get accepted. So then we said, okay, the heck with that. Let's write something for communications of the ACM. Communications of the ACM is an extremely wide distribution, you know, computing publication, much later on technical content than any of our conferences. Um, and so we submitted to communications of the ACM. These people in Rockefeller Foundation read that paper. I guarantee you they haven't read any SIGCOM papers and they haven't read any IEEE LCN papers. They read that paper and they contacted us and they said, "Where? this is the first thing, like this never had happened to me before, right? Usually I'm like begging at the door, please give me, you know, a dollar. These people came and the first couple conversations, I, you know, we're talking, they're like, can you send us some more information? And I'm just dying to say, like, What's the end game here? <laughs> you know, and, but I didn't want to seem obnoxious. So just have these conversations. Oh, let us bring in our boss. And, and, and they weren't, and, and then eventually they're like, well, okay, we're going to write a concept note, but to, to sell internally, and we're going to, you know, use some of the material. You, so anyway, that was a surprise, you know, that was a surprise to me. I guess I'm telling this story because. Um, you know, we don't tend to understand the foundation landscape very well because most of us don't go down that path. But, um, you know, maybe that's a lesson learned. Like, we wrote a paper for a more general audience. Um, we did it a bit out of frustration. Like, if that paper had got accepted, you know, at a, at a networking conference, we never would have written that communications of the ACM article. So maybe this is an example of, like, you know, think about the venues where you're publishing and where you might sometimes reach a broader audience and maybe there's an impact opportunity because you've stretched to that broader audience. Great. So without, you know, stretching the time with you anyway, yeah, I yeah. really appreciate uh, it. Yeah, Thank you done. so much, you bet. Dr. Thanks, Ella Zagura. Thank you. And of course, for others, we'll, we'll give Dr. Zagura a break, but for others who would also like to ask questions, uh, hopefully we'll still have some time over lunch. Yep. And uh, with that, we wrap up our keynote session. Thank you all very much.